Welcome. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to welcome, I've already met two people here who are here for the first time, and I want to especially welcome you. We do this on the third Thursday of every month. I still have ongoing oral surgery going on, so it's a little hard for me to talk, which is a blessing for you, because you guys know how much I can talk sometimes. Um, so we do this on the third Thursday of the month. We have prayer, and we have mass, and we have a dynamic speaker presentation, and then we have great food from the Wooden Spoon restaurant that'll be out in the activity center after uh, Craig's talk. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, and I am, I'm going to make them quick. I actually have more announcements, but we can do that in fellow, during fellowship afterwards. Um, Craig was kind enough to bring a whole bunch of copies of our bishop's pastoral letter from 2012, which is the guide for our mission in our diocese. We're all called to go and, go and make disciples. That's what Jesus tells us to do. And uh, this is our bishop's outline of how he wants us to do that. Uh, there's a copy of this on our website. In fact, there's only two things on our website. Uh, a copy of this and a copy of Bishop Thomas Olmsted's pastoral letter called Into the Breach. But for those of you who like to have hard copy things, make sure you get one of those today. He also brought a bunch of these little New Testaments. Grab one of these. Um, these are great to give out to people. They really come in handy um, to just have in your pocket even to just give to people. Um, the men's conference uh, is finally um, being announced now this week. Our diocese men's conference, there's plenty of these postcards. Take a bunch of them back to your parish, give them out to people. Uh, we'll talk about more of that later. Um, there's other stuff out there, other freebies, giveaways. Um, everybody knows what this is, right? All good Catholics know what this is. At the end of Craig's talk, uh, there'll be a Q&A session. We'll pass this basket. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of you for your generosity. Those of you who've been coming regularly, really, your generosity, it's, it's overwhelming. We really appreciate it. Uh, we like to give a stipend to our speakers. Um, and uh, we're able, some of you know who've been coming here, we get speakers to come from all over the place. And uh, we couldn't do it without your generosity. We're really, really appreciative of it. Um, our speaker tonight is Craig Pohl. Craig is the director of new evangelization for our diocese. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, he's the bishop's right-hand man. Um, you know, JP2, St. John Paul the Great, tells us that the most important mission for our church is evangelization. Therefore, the director of evangelization in our diocese, I think, is probably the most important uh, ministry that we have. Um, many of you, I know, were at the Diocesan Assembly in 2018. Craig, with a lot of help from people, but spearheaded that, which was just awesome. Um, and what is going on in our diocese? Those of you who follow what's going on in the church, you know what a light our diocese is to the church. There's so much darkness and awful stuff that's gone on in our church over the past few years. And, uh, but yet, it's a call to holiness for us to cleanse our church from within, and that is what our diocese is doing. Our diocese is recognized around the world as one of the leading dioceses in the church, and Craig is at the spearhead of that. Um, and uh, I'm just going to mention just a couple of things about him. He's a graduate of Sacred Heart Major Seminary. Um, he discerned out of the vocation to the priesthood, which I always think is awesome. Whenever I meet guys who've done that, you always see what great marriages, what great husbands they make, and what great fathers they make, because they put that discernment for the call of the vocation. You've only got two choices. And they had that as the priority in their lives. And you see how that uh, transpires into their lives when they, when they make that final decision. Um, and by the way, nobody discerns to be a priest. Your bishop discerns that for you. Um, uh, one of his, you know, he works for Renewal Ministries. And you guys know how awesome Renewal Ministries is. In fact, one of the handouts that's in the other room is uh, a list of a whole bunch of resources from our bishop. Um, and I just got reminded of that. Make sure you get that. Um, and another really cool thing about Craig that I, that I really want to mention is many of you have seen, uh, I hope you've seen, that poster that lists all of the seminarians from our diocese who are currently in the seminary. Right now there's 21 of them. Um, and out of that 21, seven of them come from three parishes, Christ the King, and then Fowler, and Westphalia. 
uh, and they are just priest making parishes, and especially 10, 15 years ago. Um, and the reason I mention that is because Craig was the youth director at Westphalia and Fowler, where all those priests are coming out of. And I know that his direction to those youth at that time who were discerning their vocations, he was a, such a big influence on them. And one of them happens to be that priest down the road, Father Matthias Salen, who was in Craig's, who was a, a punk teenager in Craig's youth program. Uh, okay, so for a guy who said he wasn't going to talk too much, I talked a little too much. God bless you all, and I want to welcome uh, Craig Pohl. Testing. Okay, well, thank you so much. Great to see you all here. Um, thanks, Rory, for putting this together. Let's give Rory a hand for all his work. <laughs> Though I do have to say the, the most difficult part of my week uh, has been I've had to spend three evenings with Rory. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not true about the three evenings. <clears throat> no, I, I really uh, love hanging out with Roy. I loved uh, just getting to know him, his passion. I mean, truly, um, he could be the mascot, or maybe he is the mascot for Men on Fire. I mean, this, this guy is on fire. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we should all get costumes that look like Rory, basically. Little... Never mind. Anyway, that's where my mind goes for some reason. Okay. Um, I like to set the timer so that I don't take too much of your precious time. Um, as always, we want to begin appropriately, especially here in church, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us. We thank you for bringing so many great people into our lives, for protecting us and watching over us, but most of all, for calling us into your family through your son, Jesus Christ. So we ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon us. Help us to feel your presence. Give us the strength to live the Christian life. Help us all to hear tonight what it is you want each of us to hear. At this time, I'd like to invite everyone in the silence of your own hearts, in your own words, to invite Jesus Christ into your heart again. Thank you, Jesus. We make all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as Rory mentioned, um, I'm the director of new evangelization for the Diocese of Lansing here. I have been for about the past seven years. Um, and that prayer, um, this is a, a very similar prayer to what I did um, a couple days ago at St. Patrick in Brighton. The prayer of opening ourselves up to inviting Jesus Christ to come into our hearts um, is distinct, really, to the new evangelization. Because one of the things they've uh, really discovered, and this was something that was discovered back in the 1990s by Pope John Paul II, he said, we are living in a time where uh, huge numbers of baptized people have just walked away from the faith. In fact, it would come as no surprise to any of us that huge percentages of people who go to church have walked away from the faith in their hearts. 
Maybe they haven't necessarily walked away intentionally, but there's been a sort of drifting or apathy in the hearts of a lot of Catholics who come to Mass every week. Now, you can judge me and say, oh, well, you're being judgmental on all these people who are coming, all these good people are coming. You may be right. Or we can leave that judging up to the surveys that Gallup and Pew and other research centers have done where people actually self-respond saying that they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't consider themselves to be disciples. They come to church for very external reasons. That's the situation we live in. You're here because you have made that decision. That's part of being a man. That's part of laying hold of your purpose in this life. To not be apathetic to the world around you. But to stand up and to pave a path for others to follow in. That's part of your purpose as a man of God. And that is God's desire for you. Matthew Kelly tells this story about this father who's very busy. He was in his study, and his young son comes up and wants to talk to him. But his dad is working at, in his office, and he doesn't really have time to, uh, to spend with his child. And so he comes up with this idea. He's going to rip out this, this page out of a magazine, and he's going to tear it up into a bunch of little pieces, and he's going to say, here, I want... I want you to put this together. So he finds this page, and it's a picture of this, the, the world. It's kind of a panned out picture of the world. And he rips it up, and he goes, here, son, I want you to work on this for a little while. And so he's thinking, okay, I just bought myself some time. Well, just in a few minutes, the young boy comes into the office and says, I've finished it. And his dad's rather stunned. How'd you do that so quickly? He said, well... It would have been hard if I w was going to try and put together the one side with the picture of the world, but it was really easy when I saw there was another picture, and it was a picture of a man. And so I decided to put that picture together. Matthew Kelly's point, get the man right, you'll get the world right. Get the man right, you'll get the world right. St. Catherine of Siena says, if you are what you should be, you will set the world ablaze. If you are what you should be, you will set the world ablaze. So what I, want, I want to ask you tonight, would you rather be someplace else? Would you rather be doing something else? I mean, there are a million things you could be doing. There are a million places you could be. Where would you rather be? What would you rather be doing? What I'd like to do is just literally just take one minute, and uh, if you have someone near you, to just share with each other, if you could be anywhere in the world doing anything, what would it be? On your mark, get set.
Okay. All right. Some of your answers. If you could be anywhere right now, doing whatever, what would that be? All right, good, good. Someone else, where would you be? What would you be doing? Oh, yes, in the back. Nice, good, yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Good. Keith. Um, my original answer is to be here. Um, to learn how to read more. Most of the stuff is in English. So, um, but my, uh, my dream is here. Do it. Do it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, of course, there's always one in the crowd. The punchline is, as you can imagine, here. The present moment is a gift. You could be anywhere right now, but God has you here. God has something for you here that he doesn't have for you someplace else. One of the things that we struggle with as men, and I think probably just humans in general, is we spend the vast majority of our time either in the past or in the future, or somewhere else. The present moment is very infrequently seized upon. The gift of the present moment, what God is doing with you right now, is the greatest thing that is happening in your life. It is the greatest place to be wherever you are in this present moment. It's hard to live in that reality, especially living in the culture that we live in. But as a Christian man, this needs to be reclaimed. Or maybe it needs to be discovered. It's constantly a battle of living in the moment and listening to what God's saying to you now. Living in in the joy of the moment or the struggle of the moment with God, for God, in God. There's a story of Father Stanley Rother. Anyone recognize that name? Yeah. Uh, recently canonized the saint. I was in Oklahoma just before he was canonized. And was he canonized or beatified? Uh, beatified, sorry. Um, it was just before he was going to be beatified. And this story is kind of interesting because um, when he was going through the seminary, uh, he kept on getting kicked back out because he wasn't that bright. He kept on getting kicked back out, and when he was kicked out, they would just say, give it a little more time. So, so he'd go back to his family farm, and he'd work on the farm. And then he'd come back a year later, and okay, let's try this again. And okay, well, let's take a, a, another little break. So he'd go back on the farm. It took him years to actually get to the point where the, the bishop would ordain him. And when he was ordained, he was sent down to South America. And it was down there that he became a saint because of what he had learned when he was not in formation. He taught the indigenous people how to cultivate the land how to plant their gardens and their fields. He taught them all these different methods of farming that he learned while he was being booted out of seminary. Can you imagine how difficult it was when he was there knowing that he needed, that he really wanted to be a priest, that God was calling him to be a priest, but he was 
They're on the farm, probably feeling trapped. But that time, that time where it felt like he wasn't where he wanted to be or should have been, was actually what contributed to his sainthood, probably more than anything. For me, I have to step back and do the same thing. Really look at my life and ask, am I seizing the moment, the grace in the moment? We need to constantly have this presence of mind because we don't know when our our lives are going to be taken. But we also know that God is always trying to make us into the men that we're supposed to be. And that with God, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Even the time when we sin, God will redeem it if we come to him. We're never better off for sinning. But God can redeem it if we look into our pasts and we are just having an awful time getting over a past sin or guilt or whatever. When we center ourselves in the moment with God, we let him do with whatever he can with this, what we have to offer in this moment. And so I'd like to invite you tonight to just be. Let go of what might be going on at home or tomorrow or someplace else in the Bahamas. We're here tonight because God has us here tonight and he has something for us. So as we know, men are very different from women. Well, at least we used to be. Nowadays, it's a little (laughs) confusing. It's a scientific fact that when we're in the womb, when, when babies are in the womb, little boys are bathed in testosterone. And little girls are bathed in estrogen. And it, so it's not just this um, sort of uh, um, outward difference between men and women. It's actually something that contributes to Every little intricacy of our minds, of our bodies, and even as we teach in our own church, spiritually, our souls. It's important to to recognize that men think very differently because that's how we were created. Yet, Society wants to castrate us. The genius of femininity is only genius if it's complemented by the genius of masculinity. There are certain traits that are distinctly masculine that we need to be proud of and we need to be heralds of. But some of the struggles that we have in today's world, and I think men in general, particular struggles, would probably revolve around things like being measured by our success, our careers, how many toys we have, how beautiful our wife is, the size of our house, how much influence we have. The list goes on and on and on. The pressures that we experience as men are directly related to how we're wired. Satan goes after those things. He goes after those things, and if he can't get you on those levels, he will try to undercut your very manhood. I heard this story about... Um, uh, when, when lions fight, 
They don't go after the jugular. They don't go after uh, the stomach. They don't go after the face. What do they go after? The testicles. Because if you can get rid of those, you've eliminated the competition. This is what Satan's up to. He's trying to demasculate, emasculate us. It's part of his game. Now there's a lot in the news about toxic masculinity, and there probably is toxic masculinity out there. But masculinity, true masculinity, is not toxic. It is an absolute necessity in the world. But if we listen to what the world tells us to measure ourselves by, we're going to actually be emasculated. St. Paul says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I heard someone say one time, your thoughts shape your beliefs, your beliefs shape your actions, and your actions decide your destiny. Your thoughts shape your beliefs, your beliefs shape your actions, and your actions shape your destiny. This is extremely important because, um, you know, I'm a little bit of a freak in this room, because I'm kind of surrounded by church stuff all day long. That's my job. It's, it's my life when I get home. It's In many ways, it's the life I chose, but it's also the life that God chose for me. I, I've always tried to just follow his will. But a lot of you are really immersed in the world every single day. You got to be. But if you listen to what the world has to tell you, and only listen to what the world has to tell you. It's going to shape your actions. It's going to decide your destiny. What we have to do as Catholic men is we have to stop. We have to stop. And we have to be in the moment. We have to check ourselves. And we have to remember what God says about us. What does God say about us? Well, you all know the story of when Jesus was baptized. It always eluded me up until a few years ago what the whole baptism thing was all about. People would say, oh, well, he just did that for, you know, uh, an, as an example for us and all this stuff. And he just, you know, needed to show us what to do and all this. Actually, there was a tremendous revelation that took place at the baptism of Jesus. The revelation was this. St. John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just something that Jesus said, hey, by the way, the Holy Spirit's coming down upon me. You can't see it, but it's really happening. There was an actual sign. They said the Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus. And a voice was heard by a third party. A voice was heard. Some people thought it was thunder. St. John the Baptist heard, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You look this up in the catechism about your baptism. And what we have taught from day one was that at your baptism, the reason these signs happened at Jesus' baptism was to tell us exactly what was going to happen <coughs> Excuse me, at our baptism. That the Holy Spirit really did descend upon you and the Father really did say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Whew. Okay. I want to go back. 
Your thoughts shape your beliefs. Your beliefs shape your actions. Your actions shape your destiny. (laughs) Your thoughts shape your beliefs. Your beliefs shape your actions. And your actions shape your destiny. (laughs) Pardon me. If you believe you're a dog because someone in your life told you you were a dog your whole life, do you think there would be a strong temptation to act like a dog? Do you think you'd constantly be battling that idea? It would constantly be there, well, if I'm a dog, I should do this. I'm going to act like a dog. You can see where this is going. If you really believe you're a child of God, a son of God, wouldn't you act like it? That's the struggle I have every day of my life. Every day of my life. This is, this is where I am, and this is where I have been for 20-odd years Craig, you're a child of the living God. You are the son of the living God. You are his son. You're his son. We say it so often and we say it so flippantly that it doesn't sink in. Let me, let me break this down a little bit more for you. Jesus is my oldest brother. He's your oldest brother. Did you know, interestingly, after the Gospels in the Bible, the word disciple isn't used as much. It's replaced with brother and sister. After the Gospels, the the disciples begin calling one another brothers and sisters. Because once you're baptized... That family bond that we have is more lasting, is more real than the family bond I have with my own children. The family bond that we have as Christians is more real, stronger than what we have with our own blood. Why? Because God forbid one of my family. God forbid I should end up in hell. But if I do, that is eternal separation. That bond is broken if I end up in hell. But as Christians, we are brothers and sisters, truly. I hesitate to bring this up because uh, this has been misinterpreted before and I beg for uh, your pardon and if I need to clarify, um, please let me know. When Jesus was talking to other Jews, he would call them brothers. When he was talking about people who were not Jews, He would call them, actually, neighbor. When Jesus was talking about fellow Christians, he was talking about brothers. Watch how he talks in the scriptures when he says neighbor and when he says brother. This is really important. You know, this is not popular right now, even in the Catholic Church. Pope Benedict taught this explicitly, but this is really big. Like, um, the difference between us as baptized Christians and people who are not baptized, we are literally, literally the sons and daughters of the Almighty God. We have been adopted into his family and they have not been. 
and they have not been. If that doesn't light a little fire underneath us to go, I would not want to be in their seat right now. They need someone to bring them into the family of God. That is a true distinction that Christ came and brought into the world. There are those who are the children of God, and then he, he talks about the children of the world. But we are called to the children of the world. It's not to say that, um, now, Jesus talking about this thing, these things, you've actually heard uh, this before, and this is what he's referencing. He says, um, it's not as though there's this uh, um, hopelessness for, the, for the, uh, the children of the world. He actually says, actually, there's more, how should I say it, responsibility on the children of the kingdom. He says, those who were given more, more will be expected. That's what he was referring to. You're in the family of God. If you just kind of kick back and just go, good to be a child of God. You don't do anything to help other people come into full union with God. You're going to have to account for that. Now that doesn't mean going off and you know, getting your theology degree and trying to become the director of new evangelization and all this stuff. That doesn't mean anything on this level. I can guarantee you there are a lot more people in here that have ascended the heights of holiness while I'm just down here just picking up the scraps. The fundamental idea here tonight is to understand that if we really believe that we're children of God, then we will act like children of God. If I, if there was a gaping pit in front of me, I mean, shards of glass at the bottom, if there was a gaping pit there, and I really believed it, I would change my life. I would change my actions to get from here to the back of the church. I would go around that pit because I really believe that pit is there. So it is with our Christian identity as sons and daughters of God. This is a challenge. It is a real challenge because the world is constantly speaking the world's truth to us, their ideas. I should really be calling it the world's lies. St. Paul says, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I touched on this the other night at, um, at St. Pat's in Brighton. This is one of the most exciting things that I, I can think of about our faith. Um, okay, so you know how our, our faith teaches us this because of Jesus. He says, when, when a man and a woman get married, they become one. And he, and he just said, this is a mystery. And he says, what God has joined, no man should, should uh, separate. So when we get married, we become one with our, our spouse. And St. Paul picks up on that theme later on in the scriptures. And he says, this is a great mystery because the bride of Christ is the church. And we are the church. And Christ wants to become one with us. He spoke about it when he said that he is one with the Father. And that he desires to be one with us. There's a word for this that we use in the Catholic Church. It's called divinization. Divinization. God wants to divinize us. I made a joke uh, um, in Brighton that God wants to make us little mini-gods. Kinda. Kinda. But not actually. Jesus said at one point, I've received everything from the Father and I will give it all to you. If he's received everything from the Father, if he's received the full inheritance like the firstborn son receives, and then he says, and I will give it all to you. Do I live like that? Do I live like that's the reality? When I look at the Beatitudes, 
and the high standard that Christ calls us to with the Beatitudes, it, that's a, ba- a brain bender until you look at it through the eyes that what Jesus was saying was, you're sons of God. You're sons of God. If God wanted to just raise up piles of money out of the ground for you, he would if he thought you needed it. Be generous. Be generous with your time. God will multiply it. Be generous with your money. God will multiply it. The Beatitudes are that super high standard that only a child of God could look at and say, I can do it because God makes it possible. Because I have all that is his. Sometimes I have to reflect because of the way the world is today that that we don't live necessarily for here. There are responsibilities here, but, but we don't live for here. St. Paul, again, he, 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 I just love it. He just nails these. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Yeah, that is our citizenship. And here's, here's another thing that, that just, this just gets me. The plans that God has for us, not just down the road, but right now, in this moment, the plan that God has for us right now, in this moment, Jesus is the king. He's the true monarch of the true kingdom that exists right now. And you are his brother. You're the brother of the king of the universe. That's why, uh, da, 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 that's why St. Paul says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. Since you are the brother of the king, you are an ambassador to the world. This is not your kingdom here. This was not Jesus' kingdom. This is good news. They can have this world. I want what he has. I want to go where he is. He's my king. This needs to be revived. Citizens of the kingdom look different, act different. We believe differently than the rest of the world. There used to be a time where we could look like everyone else, do what everyone else was doing. Some of you guys might remember that time. We have really diverged quickly in the world today. So many things that could be said about that. Going to let that go for the sake of time. So I'm going to tie this up essentially with the great words of William Wallace. Every man dies, but not every man really lives. That was awesome. (laughs) Oh, 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 perfect. Right spot on. Come on. Don't even know how to control it. Okay. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. We can't live in tomorrow because we're going to miss what God's doing right now can't live in the past because it's going to hold us back. We can't live someplace else that we want to be because we're not there. God has us right here. We are his sons, and he is calling us to greatness. So what I want to do is challenge you tonight. These Bibles, the the bishop wants to be given out at all the different gatherings that happen as a sign of 
how important he believes it is that we establish a relationship with the Word of God. When you open the Bible, the very first page is the image from the Shroud of Turin. Has anyone done any uh, study on the Shroud of Turin? Raise your hand. Okay. Please do some study on this. In fact, it was just a couple months ago that um, the, the, the latest scientific study came out that debunked the study from the 1990s that said it was a medieval fraud, even though they had no idea how these medieval people would have pulled this off. They said this was a fraud because of carbon dating. Turns out the carbon dating was actually a fraud. They proved it. It was an intentional fraud. Science cannot explain this except... Watch some of these documentaries, except for the possibility that intense bursts of radiation came out of the pores of a man laying in cloth. Every pore, they said they cannot explain how this would have happened. Oh, you got this. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. I remember that. This is really important. This is really important stuff. On the back is uh, the Our Lady of Guadalupe, another one that, that has been studied over and over and over, and they don't, they don't even know what it is, what the pigment is that's used. They don't know how it got there because it's not paint, and it's not a photograph. They don't know what it is. They've tried to figure this out. Anyway... Why? Why this? Because we live in a world that struggles to believe. We live in a world that, that needs something to prop up their faith. And when you open this up and you really realize that when you read scripture, you are gazing upon the very face of your king, your savior. And that he's gazing into your heart lovingly, telling you who you are. What you're made for where you're going, and who he is, who you were made for. This last piece is the bishop's pastoral letter. If you haven't read this yet, um, we've been sitting in the pastoral letter for seven years, and we're going to be sitting in this pastoral letter for the next seven So if you want to know what's happening in the Diocese of Lansing and be, be kept abreast of that, this is a powerful letter that gives a vision for what the bishop is doing in the Diocese of Lansing. And I'm just going to end with a quick story about the power that our culture has to erode our faith away. So this, this is a true story. It comes from Father Mike Schmitz. How many people uh, were at the, the assembly? Okay, he was one of the speakers at the assembly. He said he was approached by a gentleman who um, was conveying a sad story about his friend from China. He said, in China, of course, the true Catholic church uh, is the underground church. Um, the, the, the Catholics who are faithful to Rome are part of the underground uh, church in China. And uh, if they would be caught having mass, they would go to jail and um, uh, be tortured. Well, they were having mass, and they had someone standing outside the house, and um, the person outside the house said, guards are coming, guards are coming, guards are coming. So everyone scatters, except for the guy whose house it was. And so they could see mass was taking place, so they took him to jail. They stripped him naked for weeks. They burned him, they cut him, and they had a cattle prodder that they used to try and get information on him, uh, uh, out of him about where the priest was that was celebrating mass. He would not speak. 
Because he knew if he would tell, they would find that priest and his family and loved ones and his community would not have the Eucharist. So he safeguarded that information with his life. He was willing to die for this. A few years later, well, a couple months later, they sent him home because they realized we're not going to break this guy. Lived at home for a few months and they actually found a way to escape and come to the United States. And he was in awe of the United States. All kinds of opportunity. You work harder, you make more money. Sky's the limit. You can do this, you can do that, you can do whatever you want. You can make more money. You want to work overtime, go for it. So he wanted to provide for his family, and he was doing you know, all this different work, all these different jobs. And so he wasn't able to get to daily mass like he was able to at the very beginning of moving to the United States. And then his boss started saying, hey, you want to work on Sunday? You can work on Sunday too. So he started working on Sundays and he missed mass every so often and a year or so went by and he, just, he was only able to get to church just for Christmas and Easter. And then one year, he didn't even go to mass during Easter. I wish I was building up to a joke here, but I'm not. This is actually a true story of, of this man from China. To this day, no one really knows if he's even going to church anymore. The person conveying the story to Father Mike Schmitz said this. Don't miss this. What communist China and torture and interrogation for weeks could not do our culture did to him. That's a powerful truth. It's easy for us to just get swept over by everything we have in this culture. It's a scary truth, but as sons of God, we are entrusted to protect it and to protect those that we love, and those who we have been charged with. Anyway, I pray that God will strengthen us, that God will raise us up, God will raise up more leaders. Pray that... Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've given us in this country, but Lord... We pray that you will stand between us and Satan and his plans for us. Help us to be true men of God, living in the reality that we are your sons. That we are true ambassadors to the eternal kingdom. Bless our families. Bless our loved ones. Make make us faithful in all ways. And help us to place you at the very center of our lives. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Thank you. So Rory said something either about a question and answer for like two minutes. Or because it's like two minutes until eight. or, um, Or something else. You want to do question and answer? Not that... I feel like I could answer anything. Yes? That was quite something, the controversial part of this discussion. And I don't find it too controversial. Um, I mean, that really woke me up as far as Jesus calling certain people, whether it's the church and others, maybe. And we, we, we are definitely living in a society where we're 
Ja. Amen. St. Paul says, uh, run to win the race. Uh, he's like, it's, it's, it is, in some respects, very applicable to say this, kind of like sports. Um, he's like, hey, you know, there are a lot of runners, but there's only one winner, so run it so as to win. That's a great point. Yeah. Wow. Wow screaming from my kids that's the biggest thing um um some of the things that that keep me up at night um the honestly the getting focused on the wrong things um uh when when the faith becomes a a social club um that's that's when it can become very very destructive um uh, the, the faith, we are a family, and we will socialize as families do, but we're not a social club. We're not, um, you know, um, we're not social workers. We're not uh, like, you know, uh, um, the, the Masons or whatever. We are truly different creations. I've got a passage right here uh, oh, in my pocket that says... <laughs> We truly are different creations. And it's those, it's when people miss the mark. When, when people say, well, you know what's going to fix the church? Uh, just doing, doing something at Mass differently. Um, it's, it's about getting, it's about entry, entering into the mystery. Anyway, um, those are some of the things that I think are just kind of the roots of, uh, you had your hand up first. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this, this is one of those beautiful things about being Catholic. We get to take the whole, the whole of scriptures and take it within context, as opposed to a lot of our, our Protestant brethren who, who uh, it's an inconvenient thing to take the whole of scripture, especially that, that point where Jesus is on the cross. Uh, they have to do um, intellectual uh, gymnastics to try and get out of the one where um, Jesus says, behold your mother. Um, that doesn't work. I'm not going to go into all that, but uh, why it doesn't, you can readily find that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's it. That's it. The feud, the proud. You guys. <laughs> you had your hand up. Uh, right, yeah.
Yeah, the, the, the interior life, as a, as a son of God, um, uh, communicating with the Father is primary. It is the, uh, it's the thing you do. It is the thing that paves the way and prepares the way for everything else that we do as children of God. Um, we do, as baptized children, we do have the ability to just cut him out of our lives. You know, you can pray in our Father without even saying a word to God. Some people do. You can pray in our Father without your heart. Let me give you just one example. I, I went to, uh, when I was in seminary, I confessed to the priest. Now, now this is getting juicy. Everyone came up to the <laughs> side and said, oh, oh, yeah, okay. What'd you confess? I confessed that um, I didn't get uh, my prayers in, my breviary prayers. And he says, well, Craig, it would be good if instead of trying to get your prayers in, you tried to get into your prayer. Because it's easy to fall into that, just to go, let's just, let's do these devotionals, let's do these prayers, and good, now I can check. Um, that's, that's, that's how we sort of get, get off track. Rather than trying to get our prayers in, uh, get into our prayers. Now, that's not to say um, that if you're just really distracted, you shouldn't stay in your prayer time and all that stuff. You should, um, because that's also a sign to God that, that you, you value this time with him. But uh, the soul of the apostolate, the, what you're mentioning there, is the blueprint book uh, for evangelization. It sh it's something that should be read by everyone, really. Yes? Amen. That's right. That's right. Get out to the men's conference. Yes, sir. Yeah, God is doing something great. Um, actually, uh, I'm not here to blow smoke up your skirts, but this is a bright spot. <laughs> this is a bright spot. This is, this is um, men who are taking this seriously. Um, men who are, are really responding um, to, to uh, what God is doing in the church. Um, there are other great things like real conversions happening. There, um, with the evangelization movement, you know, you have like the Alpha series, um, Life in the Spirit. You have the small groups going on around the diocese. Um, uh, with the assemblies, we actually got to bring a large number of people together to kind of look at each other and go, oh, we're, we're relevant. Like, th this is our family. This is big. And so there was a grace that came along with those assemblies. But honestly, on a local level, what we're seeing is, and maybe you can corroborate this with your own experience, uh, no one has ever said no to this. In the past five to six years, there are still maybe people leaving the church but the core is getting stronger and larger. When I go around the diocese and I ask, what's going on at your church? People will say, well, numbers are still down, but the people who are coming are stronger than they were before, and there are more of them. So what we see is you've got this big mass of people about Right now, about 57,000 church-going Catholics in the Diocese of Lansing. That number is still kind of shrinking by about 1,000 every year. But what we perceive is that that believing core is growing. And there's going to be this point where this meets this, and you hit critical mass. You hit critical, critical mass. In fact, um, in the business world, critical mass is 20%. When a, a, a body of people who has a, um, um, a passion and has a purpose and unity, when that group hits 20% of the whole, you've hit critical mass, and now you get culture shift. In some of our parishes, we actually have that happening right now. We've hit critical mass. Do you think the critical mass probably is somewhere around the percentage of people over 2,000? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, that's a fundamental uh, indicator.
Yeah, so, um, so I'm, I'm just going to throw that right out there, and I'm going to say um, orthodoxy was one of them. Um, yep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We need more orthodoxy. We need uh, more fidelity. Um, generally speaking, the, the parishes that are, um, that are just really thriving, you can really trace it back to the leadership of their pastor. Um, the, the pastor is really focusing in on the right things. Um, uh, externals like um, straightening out the liturgies. Um, uh, we had a discussion uh, with the bishop's cabinet uh, a few weeks back, and it was around the, um, uh, the Eucharist and the, the low numbers of people, respectively, who believe in the real presence. And the bishop kind of said, oh, what do you guys think about this? And when it got to me, um, my response was, well, the thing that we do every week as Catholics does not reflect um, all that accurately what we truly believe is going on. Um, this, this is a little bit of a, like, um, this is me getting on a little bit of a soapbox. I think we need to shore up our liturgies. I think we need to do a better job as a people expressing that we really believe that's Jesus, the Son of God. And, you know, so anyway, that's a, that's a challenging thing for some people to hear. But uh, uh, the bishop actually agreed. He said, yeah, um, we, need to, we need to bring back some of the old things that we did to express physically what we're actually um, celebrating. <coughs> great, great question. Um, I actually think... Um, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of great things, but I actually think that timing is everything with that. Um, when we hit critical mass, um, it's going to be explosive. Uh, they're going to look at who we are, what we got, and they're going to really be curious about uh, what this is. So, so first of all, that's a big deal, like timing, timing. Um, is it time to go out and try to get Protestants, you have to discern that. Um, but what we need to do is have living, vibrant communities of Christians, Catholics, who are like, uh, like have a, a, a gravitational pull. Then you go out and engage in loving ways on um, uh, the, the topics that are keeping them far from, the, from, from uh, full union. And that just takes takes education. It takes befriending, really. Um, most, most people aren't going to come into the church through just kind of reading themselves in. They'll come in through, like, another person and belonging. Um, uh, Father James Mallon, who is getting Protestants, Muslims, and all this from, from his, uh, his parish, um, he says uh, the, the whole um, paradigm has, shift, has shifted. Um, people want to belong first. And then they will behave, and then they will believe. When it used to be believe, behave, belong. There was that pedagogy of how people came into the church. But um, to give you concrete answers on that, I've asked the bishop if we can start moving in that direction. Apologetics is a big one for Protestants. Just getting into um, good conversations that get them thinking. Uh, best things to do is to always ask a question, uh, answer a question with a question. It's what Jesus did. Know your Bible. Okay. Amen. 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 Get the get the two lungs breathing ag again to, together. Great.